Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this special meeting of the Oregon Environmental Quality Commission. Um, we are uh, very pleased to have a, a team here today to cover um, the request before us and some informational materials, uh, as well as some time for, for questions and deliberation. Um, Director Whitman, do you have any uh, comments for us as we're getting ready to begin? Uh, very brief. Uh, good afternoon, Chair George. Commissioners for the record, Richard Whitman, DEQ Director. We've got a team of folks here from DEQ and uh, also Oregon Department of Justice available to help um, with the discussion and presentation this afternoon. And leading that is Jennifer Weigel, our um, Deputy Water Quality Administrator. But uh, just of note, uh, Steve Mrazek with our um, 401 Water Quality Certification Program is here with us today um, in the event there are any questions regarding Pelton. Uh, and then Connie Dow, who is the manager for our Water Quality Standards Program is here as well. And then we have Diane Lloyd um, from Oregon Department of Justice. And with that, I will get out of the way and um, turn it over to Jennifer Weigel. And just one moment, as we do that, we'll just take care of a, a couple formalities as we're, we're getting underway here. Um, for the record, we will note that all uh, seated commissioners are present uh, and we only have one agenda item today. So uh, we, we don't have to review the agenda. But again, just a reminder to anybody who might be listening, as we only have three commissioners at this time, uh, normally, it is the practice of uh, the chair, as in most cases, to not vote unless uh, in the case of a tie. Uh, however, with only three sit sitting commissioners, excuse me, at this time, it is necessary um, if, for example, one was to have an affirmative vote, it would be necessary to have three affirmative votes of active members. And so um, that's just a, a variation from the normal voting situation. And so I think it's worth noting um, as we get underway today, since a decision is before the commission. All right, thanks. And with that, let's turn it over to Jennifer. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair George and members of the commission and Director Whitman. Uh, so as Director Whitman noted, uh, we're here today to discuss the petition for declaratory ruling that uh, the commission received from the Deschutes River Alliance on August 19th of this year. Um, in this presentation, I will describe what a petition for declaratory ruling is, what the EQC's role and responsibility is for such a petition, and the actions available to the EQC, as well as the implications of those actions as they consider their decision on this petition today. I will also discuss the Pelton Round Butte Hydroelectric Project and its operation, as this project is directly implicated by the request contained in the petition. I will also give an overview of the applicable dissolved oxygen water quality standards and rulemaking efforts underway related to those water quality standards and conclude with the agency's recommendation to the commission. Um, as Dr. Whitman noted, prior to taking your action, we have invited the Deschutes River Alliance to provide brief remarks to the EQC. Uh, next slide, Stephanie. Uh, so as I noted, uh, the commission received the petition for declaratory ruling on August 19th. This petition requests that the EQC issue a declaratory ruling regarding the application of um, the dissolved oxygen criteria, particularly with regard to the timing of that criteria as it applies to resident trout spawning and the associated um, numeric criteria associated with that use. Uh, the petitioner asserts that red band trout spawning occurs outside of the timeframe that DEQ applies the dissolved oxygen spawning criterion, which ends um, on June 15th. And as such, later spawning is not protected. The staff report notes a connection with the operation of the Pelton Round Butte complex based on the Deschutes River Alliance long held interest um, that the DQ has been engaged in in various forms over many years, including legal filings, um, various communications with DQ regarding Pelton Round Butte complex operations, the 401 certification, and applicable water quality standards. I'll also note here and explain in further detail throughout the presentation that also for this part of the Deschutes River 
that were any, um, were there to be any revision to water quality standards, ultimately um, in order to have an effect um, on the 401 certification and subsequent operations on the Brown View Plant Complex, um, it would need to be captured in a future 401 certification. And I'll, as I said, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail as we go through the presentation. Next slide, Stephanie. So with regard to petitions for declaratory ruling, uh, this is a process that is provided for in the Administrative Procedures Act, which allow an interested person to obtain an agency opinion on a given legal issue as applied to a particular set of facts. Upon receipt of such a petition, the agency has the discretion to give or refuse to give a declaratory ruling. In this instance, if you decide not to issue a declaratory ruling, that decision is not reviewable by any court. If the facts are in dispute, the declaratory ruling procedure is not appropriate. And if you grant the petition, um, the AG, the Attorney General model rules that the EQC follows require that you follow a particular process, which is um, first to provide notice to the petitioner, then hold a hearing before a presiding officer on the application of the established facts to the law in question, after which the presiding officer would then issue a proposed declaratory ruling, which the EQC would then review um, and then um, decide whether to issue its declaratory ruling. The declaratory ruling would be reviewable by the Court of Appeals. Um, and so that is, that's the basic process. And a few important things that um, we wanted to note here is that any ruling from this process only applies to the petitioner and the EQC. Um, and for these types of reasons and, and because of the nature of this process, typically this process is used for situations such as permits, where the applicability of a permit to a permit holder is in question and needs some sort of clarification as to what the requirements of a permit as draft, um, what the requirements of a, of a permit would be to a permit holder is, is where we typically see these types of processes. Um, just a question about that quickly, uh, Jennifer, just to make sure I understand it properly. So yes, I do remember in the briefing um, that being stated. So in the context of a permit, um, and somebody is is um, making this appeal, perhaps perhaps questioning whether or not a particular regulation is, is applicable to them in their permit. And then a decision is made, and let's say, uh, in my example, the decision is made in the affirmative. The EQC in this example believes that that regulation is applicable. Then that implementation would be um, carried out by DEQ and applied to, to said permit. Is that the case? That's my understanding, uh, Chair George, and I'm also going to invite either Director Whitman or um, our DOJ counsel, Diane Floyd, to expand upon that if appropriate. The, the, for, for a general example, does that sound reasonable or am I off base there? Oh, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Okay, good. I just my I got a signal that said my connection was unstable. So as a general under as a general example, that does sound correct in terms of how that would apply. Um, that then the interpretation of the requirements in a permit would be applicable to that particular permit holder um, based on the facts um, present there. Um, and then I was going to also invite Director Whitman or um, Diane Lloyd, our counsel, if they wanted to add any relevant um, detail or expand on that. Chair George, this is, this is Gary Vrooman, EQC Legal Counsel. I, I, could, I could weigh in. I, I think that's essentially right. Uh, in a declaratory ruling between the two parties on like a permanent matter, you would be resolving things like permit, things that would go, that would go into the permit and then it would be kind of in between the, the EQC and the, and the petitioner. So that, that's what that means to be binding between the two parties. So like any declaratory ruling wouldn't affect any other third party or wouldn't be binding as to them or, or their situation necessarily. Okay. Does that answer your question? I think it does. And then, and then you can help me with then, because believe me, I, under, I certainly understand that these are not exactly, my, my, my example is not parallel to the, to the situation before us today, but having not dealt with this very much, I'm just wanting to make sure 
that I understand on the meaning of the statement that has been shared. So then let's just say again, uh, a hypothetical example, Let, let's say the EQC hypothetically uh, decided in the affirmative. Now, what's important for us to understand then is that uh, that would only be binding between the petitioning parties and the EQC. And in this case, that would then what? That would then set up the need for such an agreement to be evaluated in the upcoming triennial review. You know, if you see, I'm just trying to, I understand this isn't as simple as a permit, but I'm just trying to understand, you know, what it, what it would mean in this type of context. Yes, Chair George, and I'm, I'm going to perhaps ask um, at Gary Vrooman if he can expand on that in this instance. Uh, I th and then maybe maybe Diane Lloyd would also be good to weigh in here. But Chair George, I think I think the point there would be the other parties with interest other than EQC, DEQ, and the petitioner wouldn't be bound by the decision, so it wouldn't technically apply to them. And and I think that may be the interest. And I think um, Stephanie, I believe Diane Lloyd is. Uh, uh, her her audio is by phone. If you could unmute 503-378-8448. I think she might want to weigh in a little bit more on this point. I think she's muted. And uh, thank you. Um, this is Stephanie Calder, commission assistant. So that phone line ending in 8448. Um, should now be able to um, present has been asked to unmute. Thanks, Stephanie. Chair George, members of the commission, can you hear me? We hear you well. Perfect. Thank you. So, so yes, in this case, a declaratory ruling from the EQC determining that the standard needed to apply to a broader period of time, which Jennifer would get, we'll get into the details further. But mm -hmm. that would technically be binding to the petitioner and the EQC. Um, I think in, in that case, the presumption would be then that that would be considered more broadly in a rulemaking. I think the larger point here is that it wouldn't affect any um, either permits or 401 certifications um, to other parties until those were considered um, at a later time, so either in permit renewal or in, in any needed modification to a 401 certification. Okay, I, I think I, I've got it. I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on that because, um, well, obviously it pertains to, to the decision that's going to come before the commission. All right, thanks for that sidebar. Uh, please continue, Jennifer. Yes, Chair George. Uh, next slide, Stephanie. So um, the next few slides, I'm just going to give a little bit more background um, about the Pelton Round Butte complex, which is a directly upstream of the segment in question. Um, and so um, the Pelton Round Butte um, hydroelectric project includes the Round Butte, Pelton, and re-regulating dams on the Deschutes River. Um, in 2004, there was a settlement with more than 20 signatories, which resulted in a settlement agreement with numerous actions with the collective objective to restore natural sustainable steelhead production in the blocked Deschutes and Crooked Rivers upstream of the project. In conjunction with the requirements of the 401, which I will talk about in a moment, a major aspect of these commitments was the construction and operation of a surface water withdrawal structure to allow effective downstream collection and passage of smolts through the project and which would also allow the project to be operated so as not to measurably increase the temperature over what would occur naturally if the project were not present, as well as meet other water quality requirements. The parties to the settlement recognized that there was a limited volume of cold water available to pass through the project and that the project needed to be operated to achieve both water quality objectives and to maximize benefits to fish, including steelhead reintroduction above the project. As a result, the settlement recognized that there would need to be a period of time to adapt and adjust how the selective water withdrawal structure was operated to achieve these objectives and to understand how to maximize the achievement of these objectives. 
The project's operations have, um, since, the, since the construction and, and operation of the selective water withdrawal tower, have shifted its temperature profile to very closely mimic without, quote unquote, without project conditions, which has resulted in pushing peak temperatures earlier in the calendar year and now meets the applicable dissolved oxygen criteria most of the time. The selective water withdrawal structure also is being operated to induce juvenile smolt into specific areas of the project so that they are able to pass through the project. Uh, next slide, Stephanie. So on the 401 certification, as a brief reminder, when there is a federal license or permit that is being issued, uh, DEQ issues a 401 certification that considers Oregon's water quality requirements and specifies what is necessary um, for the permit or license holder to do to meet those requirements. Those conditions are then incorporated into the permit or license, in, which in this case is the um, FERC license as conditions. The project um, in this instance is being operated under the terms of a FERC license, in, which includes the 401 water quality conditions. When DEQ issues such a certification, it evaluates the applicable water quality standards that are in, in effect at the time of issuance. Um, and this, and so for this, for the um, Pelton Round View project, um, DEQ issued the current 401 certification in 2002. Any changes uh, to the applicable water quality standard would need to be reflected in a modified 401 certification in order for it to be effective on the operations of the Pelton Brown Butte complex. Uh, PGE, Port and General Electric, has submitted a request for a modification of the 401 certification in 2020 on behalf of itself as the operator of the project and the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs as the co-owner and joint licensee of the project. Next slide, please, Stephanie. So just briefly, I just wanna present a, a map here that the segment highlighted in green is the segment of the river that is being addressed by the petition that is um, immediately below the Pelton Round Butte complex. And I'll talk a little bit more about all these various use designations in the next couple of slides here, but wanted to give you a quick visual of what we're talking about. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so in the reach highlighted in green on the previous map, there are several uses assigned to that area. First is the designation as core cold water between Pelton Round Butte Dam and the Warm Springs River. Uh, DEQ applies the base criteria for cold water species of eight milligrams per liter in accordance with procedures established with EPA and various clarification memoranda. So that there is depicted in yellow. Um, secondly, uh, DEQ also designates that reach for salmon and steelhead spawning starting downstream of the Pelton re-regulating dam that has dates associated with it from October 15th through June 15th. You can see that in green in this, in this little bar chart. In addition, um, in its water quality standards, DEQ has beneficial uses described for resident trout spawning and an associated criterion of 11 milligrams per liter. The location and timing of these uses for resident trout are not specifically identified in rule other than stating that they apply to quote unquote active spawning areas used by resident trout species. So to, to clarify how DEQ would ensure that resident trout spawning populations would be protected, DEQ clarified in a memo to EPA that it would apply the resident trout spawning use in the criteria in locations that are also designated for salmon and steelhead spawning during the dates of January 1st through June 15th. So you can see what we've attempted to depict here in this, in this bar chart is that we have salmon and steelhead spawning that applies beginning in October 15th through June 15th. And because we've identified that location for salmon, we also have um, defaulted to 
um, identifying that as suitable habitat and locations for red band trout, for red band, which is a resident trout spawning beginning January 1st through June 15th also. So as a result, the dissolved oxygen spawning criteria applies beginning October 15th and through June 15th with the, um, the, um, the remaining criteria in the eight milligrams per liter, which applies the remainder of the year from June 15th to October 14th. So for resident trout spawning, uh, DEQ adheres to the dates in the memo that DEQ issued to EPA, unless there is compelling and unambiguous information indicating a different time period is more appropriate. In this instance, we haven't reached that conclusion and are considering the available data as part of DEQ's rulemaking, which I'll describe in the next few slides. Next slide, please, Stephanie. Okay, so since the current fish and aquatic life uses for temperature associated with our temperature criterion were designated in 2003, and the location of uses for dissolved oxygen spawning were never des designated specifically in rule, DEQ is developing a rulemaking to update the fish and aquatic life uses based on scientific data and information applicable to both standards statewide. We are evaluating the available data related to resident trout spawning time periods in conjunction with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and federal and tribal fisheries agencies experts. And we have not yet finished that process and reached definitive conclusions about what changes might be necessary in the lower root of shoes, which is relevant to this discussion, nor statewide. Um, this, is, this is the type of um, data information and decisions that will be considered within the current rulemaking effort. The types of issues um, uh, and how to evaluate the types of information presented in the Deschutes River Alliance petition um, will be considered by DEQ through the ongoing statewide rulemaking to update and refine the fish and aquatic life use designations. Um, these considerations are complex and will benefit from the engagement of the public as well as fisheries experts. The changes made through the rulemaking will also need to undergo review and approval by EPA and consultation with the federal fisheries agencies. Um, as we talked about in our in the last commission meeting and our discussion of the triennial review and, and um, recently, we do plan to present the new designations to EQC for um, your consideration and adoption in late fall of 2022. And are also planning to give you um, an update with an informational item about our progress in mid 2022. Next slide, please, Stephanie. So in front of the commission, you have, um, you have two options. Um, the first option that you have, um, you can deny the petition, which in this instance would mean deferring to the rulemaking process that DEQ has underway to update fish uses and consider data and information as part of that process, which will include the lower to shoots. Or you can agree to initiate a declaratory ruling process, which would follow the process that we discussed at the outside of this presentation, which begins with holding a hearing. Um, next slide, please. Uh, DEQ's recommendation is that the EQC deny the petition. Um, the issues that are raised in this petition are complex and are, in our view, best suited to consideration within the rulemaking process that has been structured to include scientific experts, identifying the best available data, and a forum for publicly addressing issues of policy. For these reasons, the issues raised within the petition are better addressed through the current rulemaking process and within the 401 modification. In addition, in both the rulemaking um, and the 401 certification development, there is an opportunity for all interested in the management of the Pelton Round Butte Plant Complex and the Deschutes River water quality um, to participate in those processes. Um, DEQ is 
planning to run these two processes such that the 401 modification can incorporate the results of the water quality standards fish use update rulemaking. In addition, um, as we described in the staff report, um, DEQ does propose that the EQC plan to hold an information item focused on the Pelton Round Butte project and associated issues with water quality in the tributaries above and below the project in late, 20, in late winter 2022. Uh, this will provide the commission an opportunity to hear from representatives from the project as well as interested parties such as the Deschutes River Alliance. Um, next slide, please, Stephanie. Um, we do now um, wanted to provide an opportunity to ask um, any questions that you may have of us and any discussion. And as we noted at the outset, we do also have um, Deschutes River Alliance here, um, and I know they would like to make a, a brief statement to the commission. So, um, uh, Chair George, however you would like to proceed. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, what I think I'd like to do is, is pause and provide an opportunity for some questions and answers now, um, and then and then we'll go on with the uh, petitioner's presentation, uh, just just so people can can get their ideas out if they have uh, questions about the presentation so far. Commissioner Kyle. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I appreciate a lot of the context on this. Um, I guess my first question is, since the stretch of the waterway uh, is part of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, have they been consulted with this petition? Have they been this petition? Have they been involved in these discussions? Um, I'm sorry, Chair, Chair George and Commissioner Kyle, um, your audio broke up a little bit. I heard I heard a question about consulting with the tribe, but there was some of the contact, context that I missed. Uh, that was the bulk of it. Sorry, my, my internet, I, I'm going to turn off my video because my internet is a little unstable at the moment. I just got a warning. Um, so hopefully this makes it better. My question is really, um, since the stretch of the river is part of and borders the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs. Um, has that tribal government, are they part of this petition? Have they been consulted in this position? Um, you know, they do have sovereign rights with regards to their resources. So how involved have they been with this petition? Uh, Chair George and Commissioner Kyle, um, we, have communicated um, with the um, Water Control Board at the Warm Springs. Um, they are also um, joint licensees and co-owners um, co of the Pelton Round Butte project. And so in that capacity, we have been communicating with them to let them know that we have received this petition and we are considering it. Um, with regard to um, the petition itself, um, it is, um, it is, a, it is a petition to uh, the commission and, and DEQ about the interpretation of our water quality standards. I will say broadly, our practice is when we are um, contemplating changes to water quality standards that we do um, explicitly engage and do outreach with, um, with tribes in Oregon um, and invite them to participate and or consult as is their preference um, in those rulemaking processes. Um, and that would be our intention with the water quality standards rulemaking process itself. Um, and so that would, and I would invite um, either Director Whitman or others, if you would like to to add to the add to um, the information I just I just provided. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> with Chair George. With your permission, I'll add a little bit more to what Jennifer said. So, um, a couple of things here. We, um, we, this is a water body that we share responsibility for with the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs. And so it has been our practice to work in close collaboration with the Confederated Tribes on really any issue regarding management of the river, but in particular issues around standards where, where the tribe actually has um, authority under federal law to set its own standards for protecting uh, beneficial uses in the Deschutes River. I think um, 
This is one of the reasons, frankly, that we do not believe that a declaratory ruling process is the right forum for these issues to be considered because um, the Confederated Tribes are not currently a party, would not need to be a party to the proceeding, creating the potential for real confusion over um, if, if the petition were to be granted and the commission were to interpret the application of the state's rule in the manner that the petitioners are suggesting, there would be some um, discontinuity between the state standard and the tribal standard. And at least in staff's view, the right place to have this conversation is uh, in, a, in a proceeding where everybody is able to participate. And that would be a rulemaking proceeding. In fact, the rulemaking proceeding of the Jennifer Weigel described where everybody can participate and the, all of the interest involved in this very important river system can be heard and considered by the commission together. Okay, thank you. Um, are the uh, the red band trout, red residential red band trout, are they um, have any ESA listing designations? Uh, Chair George, they do not. Thanks for that clarification. And so this this might be um, fall back into the process question, but. So reading the, the petitioners um, submittals, it, they make reference to, to several studies and, you know, photographic dated evidence of red bound, residential red band trout uh, spawning. Does DEQ dispute the existing data that uh, seems to support, or at least the petitioners claim support um, year round spawning? So Chair George, uh, again, for the record, Richard Whitman, DEQ Director, this is another reason why DEQ is recommending denial of this petition. Notwithstanding the assertions in the petition, there is not agreement on the facts here regarding the spawning season for red band trout. We have conferred with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife I have reviewed the materials in the petition, including the written statements in the petition. Um, and with respect to DRA, they don't say that there is agreement from ODFW to the assertions in the petition. There's, we've been told by ODFW that um, they don't agree there is year round spawning uh, in this section of the river. And so, this is again another reason why a, a declaratory ruling, there are agreed upon facts. And I'm afraid we do not have agreed upon facts in the situation. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and Commissioner Kyle, I too have gone uh, to pitch your off because of internet instability. So just uh, remember to, to you know, use your raise hand function or come in briefly if you have another question. There we go, Commissioner Kyle. <laughs> that makes sense. I was raising my hand and uh, normally you're really on it. Um, so kind of just stepping back a little bit, uh, our, go our, our goal is to maintain and preserve and restore clean here water in the fish habitat. I think we all agree on, on that goal. And I'm still trying to kind of wrap my head around um, the purpose of this declaratory petition with regards to, to our goals. Um, and it seems like the impetus for this is the fact that there is a spawning period, potentially, but that might be the debated fact around when um, the current ruling stops and the new ruling starts. And so this is really kind of just a, a timeliness issue of adopting dissolved water, dissolved oxygen standards. Is that kind of this in a nutshell? 
Um, Chair George and Commissioner Kyle, um, as we understand and, and interpret the petition and, and, and the petitioner's interests, and, and they'll have a moment to, to speak to it themselves in a moment, but it is, um, it is around the dissolved oxygen criteria currently um, it is it no longer applies after June fifteenth to protect resident trout spawning, um, and so petitioners would like to have that date extended um, later in the year, year round, um, and that is um, that's our understanding of the interest in in the request, um, and because of the petitioners past history and long interest in the operations of the Pelton Round View. Um, we think that the, the, would like to also see that be um, reflected in both the requirements and operation of the Pelton Round View project. Um, the specific matter about what is, whether or not an, a date different than June 15th should be um, uh, applicable in the state's water quality standards for dissolved oxygen is the precise type of questions that are being considered and will be reflected in, in the rulemaking um, that the Water Quality Standards um, Program is taking on now um, and we'll be working on over the coming year. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there and I, I hope that answered your question. No, I'm just that I'm trying to kind of understand the context and because I'm trying to understand the context. So, um, and DEQ is currently under this because you mentioned that this is going to be hitting our agenda in the late fall of 2022. So we have a rule that's kind of um, stopping June 15th with a new rule coming in in late fall. Is that, was that the current kind of timeline for addressing this? And so the concern is that there might be a spawning period that were, that falls between those, those points in time. Uh, Chair George and Commissioner Kyle, yes, um, that, that that between now and when this rule would come to you, um, there will be another resident trout spawning season um, that where the status quo in terms of rule applicability would continue to apply. Um, and I believe it's also relevant to point out that um, changes in a water quality standard, even under a scenario where, where um, a result was it a that those changes occurred sooner, if we concluded there were changes that needed to be made, um, would not be reflected in any operational requirements for the Pelton Round Butte complex project, unless and until that for the 401 certification was modified to reflect any new or differing requirements. But the process of getting the new DO standard and all of the consultation with groups and, and just thinking process wise, that's already underway. That's correct. And there is, a, it's on the calendar for being addressed. Correct. Um, uh, Chair George and Commissioner Kyle, um, our water quality standards group is already substantially underway. Um, they have just completed working with a technical um, advisory group to help form some of the, the process and procedures and how to consider some of the, uh, um, how to consider this data and information and how to ensure that we're looking at the best data. And we're gonna be migrating into the next phase of the rulemaking project, which will be to convene a rule making advisory committee um, later this year. And so we will begin that more formal rulemaking process very soon. Okay, thank you. All right, at this time, uh, I think I would like to go ahead and allow our petitioners uh, to share their thoughts. Um, I believe we have a hard stop at one, so I wanna make sure they have the opportunity to do that. And then likewise, commissioners have the opportunity to ask questions of them. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you, uh, Ben, welcome. Well, thank you and good afternoon, Chair George and commissioners. My name is Ben Kirsch, and I'm the staff attorney for the Deschutes River Alliance. Thank you for taking the time to consider this issue. Uh, to start, I want to remind everyone that this is not just a hypothetical exercise of statutory interpretation. As long as DEQ's artificial, artificially deemed non-spawning period continues, red band trout will face potentially lethal conditions during their sensitive spawning and incubation periods. And this will threaten one of the last reliable recreational fisheries on the lower Deschutes, which will also threaten the Central Oregon communities. 
whose economies rely heavily on river-based tourism. Inaction here will hurt both the Red Band and the Oregonians who rely on them. So turning to our petition, I want to start by noting it's it's much more straightforward than has, has been said here. Um, all we are seeking is clarification on a very narrow portion of that standard, uh, the spawning period for resident trout in the lower Deschutes. And once clarification is given, no further action will need to take place. Everything else about the standard is already uh, is already spelled out by federally approved these federally approved documents that have been referenced. We seek no changes to the current law and no changes to the to the Pelton Project's operational requirements. And until uh, those forthcoming updates are finalized, those are what apply. Um, and just to state clearly again, it's just the red band trout on just the lower deschutes that we're focused on, the spawning standard. Um, and as, as was kind of uh, laid out, the salmon and steelhead spawning versus the resident trout spawning standard uh, are quite different. Uh, just where, where the salmon and steelhead spawning standards are based on maps, uh, resident trout are based on just location and timing. So put simply, uh, the spawning DO standard protections apply to any water body where resident trout spawn at the times they actually spawn and continue until eggs are finished incubating. Any question about the specific spawn timing in the lower deschutes of these red band trout are already resolved in DEQ's uh, uh, approval of the Pelton Review Project's uh, water quality certification and operational requirements. In the finding and evaluations report, spawning was determined to occur practically year round. And this is echoed in the water quality management and monitoring report, which, which mandates the spawning DO protections be applied for quote the entire year. This is the current uh, operational requirements. So we are just seeking that uh, the EQC clarify that the DO standard apply to red band trout year round. Uh, and for nearly the last decade, this is not how uh, dissolved oxygen has been applied in the lower deschutes. Uh, starting in 2012, DEQ began carving out that full third of the year between June 15th and October 15th, where it just merely deemed that red band spawning does not occur. And this was enshrined in a series of interim agreements that DEQ signed with Portland General Electric, the operators of the Pelton project. And by doing so, it deviated from this location and timing based DO standard. And this is the sole petition, the sole issue of our petition to figure out whether this artificially deemed non spawning period is allowed by the currently written water quality standards. Um, DEQ has stated that we're seeking modifications to operational requirements, but that, that's not true. DEQ, however, through these interim agreements, uh, has absolutely changed operational requirements that you can read in the water quality management monitoring plan. And in doing so, displaced the carefully crafted terms in the 2004 settlement agreement. Um, and it should be also noted that none of these interim agreements were ever submitted for public comment. So we have had no opportunity to um, get to this issue otherwise. Uh, DEQ justifies this non-spawning period based on that 2004 clarification memo that it sent to the US EPA, but that letter has no legal weight. Uh, the EPA did not request the letter, and it was not never um, considered by the EPA when it was considering the water quality revisions. So at this point, it's just a letter that it sent to the EPA. Worse, the non-spawning period is directly contradicted by firmly established science. It's most clearly seen in ODFW's own science and own uh, timing use charts, which clearly show that spawning uh, extends until mid-July, and then egg incubation, which is also protected by the spawning period, extends until August. And if you were to look at the Confederated Tribes water quality uh, standards, they deem uh, red band spawning occurs from March 15th until August 15th, and then they designate egg incubation until October 1st. So that would just leave two weeks between the salmon and steelhead spawning DO standard and resident trout. Um, PGE has also undertaken a series of annual spawning surveys where they have evidence of this post June 15th red band spawning. Um, so by ignoring this, 
this readily available science, DEQ has been failing to use this best information currently available from its sister agency and from the, the, the entity regulated by it. And the solution here is straightforward. With, with EQC direction, DEQ would begin to properly enforce spawning DF standard, which is when and where resident trout spawn. And when that does happen, operational requirements at the Pelton Round Butte project will automatically kick in and trigger spilling whenever needed to meet the standard. Uh, but until that happens, it won't be met. And I want to remind everybody that life on the Lower Deschutes has been very difficult this year. The rivers, the lifeblood of many Central Oregon communities, and the angling closures this year have been extremely difficult, not just on the guides and recreators, but on the hotels, restaurants, and shops that rely on river-based tourism for their livelihoods. Um, it's crucial that the reliable recreational fishery that Red Band Trout create be protected to support these local economies. We urge the EQC to end the artificial non-spawning period in the lower deschutes and protect spawning salmonids year round or whatever it deems to be most correct. Um, the current DO management is not supported by the current law or by science. And while it continues, red band trout and central Oregon communities suffer. Thank you for your attention to this important issue. And we're happy to answer any questions now and look forward to your swift action on this. Thank you, Mr. Kirk. Um, if I may, I'd like to, to uh, just jump in and make sure I understand um, one one of your points that was made. So um, you were responding uh, to what you felt was an assertion by DEQ that said um, that if the EQC were to um, essentially um, agree that there this um, there's this year round uh, residential trout spawning required implementation of the more protective standard. Um, I, think, I believe your statement was that, that would not require any um, modification in facility management under the current 401. Um, and it, it is your point then simply because you believe that the, the current procedures and requirements of the existing agreement would then just essentially require the management to correspond with that more protective DO standard. I just want to make sure I understand that because obviously you wouldn't be pursuing something if you didn't think it would then prompt a change. So I just want to make sure that we're using precise language and then I want to give DOJ the opportunity to respond. Sure, yeah. And so this the project's operations are, are focused by the water quality management and monitoring plan. And in that, the dissolved oxygen monitoring plan says that when the, when the enforced standard is not being met, that they're, they will undertake spilling at the re-regulating dam to meet that standard. And so, mm -hmm. so right now, the standard is not being enforced during that June to October period. And so they aren't spilling when they don't need to. So if the standard is, is enforced at whatever the, the EQC deems is the correct standard, 9 or 11 milligrams per liter, that that will automatically happen. The spill okay. will automatically happen. Understood. Thank you just for that clarification. Uh, Mr. Kirsch, I just want to make sure whether or not we, we uh, do have agreement or we do not have agreement on behalf of DOJ. DO, um, DOJ, um, would you like to respond to, to that point at all? Either Diane or, or well, not DOJ, but our director or um, Gary? If I could, <clears throat> Chair George, I think what I just heard um, Mr. Kirsch say is that the declaratory ruling, if it were um, granted in the manner that the petition request would, under the terms of the water quality management and monitoring plan, um, would require a change in spill at the re-regulating dam. Uh, at the downstream end of the Pelton project in order to, because that's what the WQMMP says currently, uh, if DO levels are not being met. Um, so coming back, if I, if I could, coming back to the point I think staff tried to make earlier, um, effectively this would create uh, confusion about application of the state standard versus the tribal standard versus the 401 
that again, we think need everybody at the table to discuss what needs to be done when, and that that needs to happen first in the rulemaking context to make sure there's agreement on the facts around spawning seasons. And secondly, at a table um, in process where modifications to the 401 certification are being considered. Can I just clarify for a moment how spilling works right now? Well, um, so I, I would love to do that. Um, at the same time, I do think um, I want to make sure that other commissioners have an opportunity to raise questions about other issues. So um, if, if you don't mind, Mr. Kirsch, I'm going to go ahead and turn to them and see if there are other issues they want to address. It, they want to address. I am not seeing the commissioners waving at me right now. So go ahead uh, and please go ahead and, and uh, give us your, your take on that. Sure. So right now, spilling is not specifically set at certain times to occur. Spilling is triggered automatically when the dissolved oxygen standard is not being met. So right now, spilling could occur on August 15th. It could happen next year on June 30th if, if the standard is not being met. So this is this will happen automatically. So I don't, and again, it won't change anything in the certification. It will, are, it will still just be based on that standard being enforced. So when DEQ determines um, that the standard is not being met, spilling happens automatically. So there is no change to the certification or its terms or spilling regimen at all. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, uh, just a, a related question is, is there any belief that spill has a negative impact on other uh, fisheries of concern or protected uh, fisheries uh, that, you know, is, is perhaps any other reason that people do are concerned uh, f that there might be additional uh, seasons of spill? Uh, Chair George, I'm not uh, aware that this is um, a, bi a big issue um, with other fisheries. And I want to come back to how uh, dissolved oxygen is managed, how it was chosen to be managed by the Water Quality Management and Monitoring Plan, and say that okay. this is how DO, this DO standard is met, is through spilling. So if there's a better way to meet this, the DO standard, we're, we're all for a better way. Um, but right now, it's through spilling, so. Understood. All right, well, thank you uh, for, for your points and bringing those to the table. Uh, just keeping an eye on the time, I do know it is short. Um, are there any other questions or comments from our commissioners? I, I, George. Vice Chair Grasso. I, I guess I'm just trying to understand, um, there's a lot of information that, 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 that's in this and, 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 and it's complex and I, and I can appreciate the, the complexity there and, and what We've, we've, we've wrestled with time and time again as we've come back to water quality issues. I, do, I want to understand what, I mean, I hear the comments that Ben is sharing around sort of not, not, not much needing to change in terms of, nothing needs to change in terms of water quality certification. I just love to understand from the agency, what is, what is all being wrapped into this water quality recertification process or, or, or the, the 401 certification process? So I feel like there's, there's a lot that was pointed to there and I want to make sure I understand, is that where we are seeing everything Come together, so to speak, where we're where we're we're having these broader conversations with with stakeholders. Is that what I'm is that what I'm hearing, or is it some other process that you all are identifying? And so, that's a question for staff. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll jump in here, Chair George, for the record, Richard Whitman. I'm, so, first of all, Vice Chair Barrasso, um, there would be um, an examination of the question of when are red band trout spawning and incubating in this stretch of the river that would be looked at in rulemaking uh, that is occurring next year and that we expect to come to the commission at the end of, uh, at the, end of the fall next year. And then secondly, uh, immediately following after that, there will be consideration of a requested modification to the 401 certification for Pelton. Uh, that again would be open to 
interested parties to participate in that would um, look specifically, not only at it um, dissolved oxygen and temperature, but um, uh, other aspects of uh, the facility operation that uh, Portland General is seeking to modify in, in the 401 certification. I hope that responds. So the two opportunities essentially to address these issues. And describe the, time, the timing. I just want to make sure I understand the timing again in both. For the rulemaking, um, it would be coming to the commission late fall of next year. So that would mean public process in advance of that would be happening during the uh, late spring, summer of um, 2022. And then the 401 uh, is, I said, immediately after completion of the rulemaking. Thank you. OK. And so I want to touch upon something very quickly before we contemplate our, our next step. So we've heard that a report will come back in late winter 2022. So does that mean December 2022, or does that mean February 2022? Chair uh, sure, George. I'm sorry, Commissioner Kyle. I was going to say, and I heard late fall 2022. So I think this is, I think this is the first point. Okay, so let me try and clarify here. We've suggested a third opportunity, essentially, to have more of a public process around what's going on with the lower Deschutes and operation of the Pelton project. That would be a non-decisional informational opportunity for a hearing not a hearing, I'm sorry, an, an informational agenda item with the commission that would occur late winter of 2022 before the rulemaking is completed and early enough in the rulemaking process so that you and we can hear from all of the interest in the lower Deschutes about these issues um, to help inform both the rulemaking and eventually the 401 modification. So we didn't stress that in the staff presentation, but that is part of the recommendation to the commission is that okay. we provide this additional opportunity for public input. And that would be in December or February, 2022? It would be probably February of 2022 next year, February. Okay. Yeah. Just want to be uh, more more clear. All right. Well, so then, thank you very much for that. Um, so th what we need to do now is is decide upon our, our next action. Uh, we understand that uh, both DEQ has made a recommendation, and it is um, the decision of the EQC. Um, and I think there's you know there's a primary decision to be made directly in regard to the declaratory ruling. And then there's, you know, perhaps additional uh, endorsement or, or providing um, a direction to DEQ for a, um, you know, a report or other meetings. So just to be clear, um, perhaps Gary can assist us with this. Uh, Gary, would be the best way to pursue this to um, simply call for a motion. And if a commissioner wished to make a motion in support of the petition for declar declaratory ruling as submitted. Ah, here we go, here we go, thank you. Okay, and so option two then would trigger the process that was described earlier. Excellent, thank you. All right, uh, commissioners, do we require any further discussion uh, before we entertain a motion? Commissioner Cobb. Yeah, and, um... Because to me, this is really the important point. This is clearly, you know, we all treasure this resource and we want to see the best for it. And it's this process that I'm still kind of stumbling over for. So, and there is a process that we haven't even talked about, which is the establishment of the DO and, and actually getting a more permanent solution in place that's underlying it. So, in, in my head, the process that. Commissioner Kyle. I apologize for interrupting you. Would you mind maybe turning off your video? You're kind of becoming garbled. Thank you. Yep, let's see if this works. So yeah. my understanding, not just of what is happening at EQC right now, is that there's already been effort, there's already work going on to establish the DO and get the data. 
that there's going to be public comment information on this coming in February with the idea that a rulemaking is done by late fall, kind of the end of the year, winter. That's the process that's currently in motion at EQC. Is that correct, Richard? Or Jennifer? Yes, and just, just to clarify one, one small aspect of that, Commissioner Kyle, is that we would provide a broad informational overview in February of both the complex and its operations and what's in, in, in progress in the water quality standards efforts. We would um, come back in the um, summertime more specifically on the rulemaking and where that's at. And then the rulemaking would come before the commission for your consideration and proposed adoption in November timeframe 2022. Okay, thank you. Any further comments before a motion is brought forward? All right, hearing none, I uh, would open the floor uh, if a commissioner wishes to make a motion at this time. Yeah, George, I'll go ahead and I can make a motion. I'll make a motion uh, that I move that the commission deny the petition and allow DEQ to propose updated use designations following a rulemaking process. Motion has been made. Do we have a second? So between the dogs barking, if you can hear me, uh, I second it. You, you second the motion. Is that correct, Commissioner Kyle? That is correct. Very good. And your dogs may as well. Okay. Uh, motion has been made and seconded. One last call for further discussion before we call the vote. Hearing none. All those in favor of the motion, option one, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify same sign. Aye. The motion carries. Oh, wait. We can't do it that way, can we? No, because it has to be a, an F affirmation of the motion. Okay, so for the record, uh, because of the mistake of the chair, I'm going to recall the vote. And that is my fault. My apologies. Motion has been made and seconded. We are going to re-clarify our vote. Uh, all those in favor of the motion uh, that is option one as presented in the material signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, are those any opposed? No opposition. The motion carries. Okay. I do know that there may be some that have to leave very quickly, and we understand if that is the case. I do want to spend just another minute. I think we got this clarified, but I want to make sure we really have this clarified. So in approximately February of the upcoming year, DEQ is going to bring an agenda item before the EQC that is going to invite both the petitioners and other uh, management agencies, affected parties, the tribe, to the table to discuss uh, this, this standard issue, related standard issues, the upcoming and how those standard issues um, interact with the upcoming 401 certification and the upcoming standards review. Is that a correct statement? Sure, George, that's correct. Yep. Okay. Uh, so very good. Um, is is Director Whitman? Is it helpful at all for the the commission to direct DEQ to do that? Just for the record. Uh, as you wish, Chair George. We're we're happy to be directed to do this. I think I think that does add some, uh, for a non technical term here, some oomph uh, to to this um, session in February and will help get uh, a broad set of interests um, to come to that session before the commission in February and express uh, their views on different aspects of this. I think it's helpful. All right. Um, commissioners, un understanding the, um, the, the, the idea here and that it might, it might signal the EQC's uh, very serious interest in this topic and ensuring that uh, a thorough and rigorous 
uh, examination of those standards that are necessary to protect fisheries occurs uh, sooner rather than later. Does this, uh, does anyone object to perhaps the EQC uh, passing a motion directing DEQ to bring uh, that informational agenda item before the EQC um, no later than March 2022? Uh, this is Commissioner Patel. I'd actually really like to see that. Um, this is a resource we want to protect cool, clean water with enough oxygen, and it is a goal of ours. And uh, I appreciate learning more about this whole project, or that is the wrong word, but uh, issue. And I think that can move forward quickly. Very good. All right, at this time, I will entertain a motion. So moved. A motion to have <clears throat> DEQ. I might miss the words, Kathleen, uh, Chair George. So a motion to have DEQ come back to speak to um, the, these water quality criteria, the, the, the process to update the criteria, as well as the certification process, bring together stakeholders, um, and to do that before March of 2022. I think you got it, uh, Vice Chair. Do we have a second? Seconded. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Hearing aye, hearing uh, all, then there is no opposition. The motion passes. And um, I, I think I just too want to take the opportunity um, to thank the petitioners, even if the EQC did not feel that they could approve this action today. Um, I, many will know that uh, I often share that I believe that we owe Oregonians and our resources a much higher sense of urgency in regard to protecting our fisheries. And so this is going to bring this to our table. It's not going to leave uh, our table because we've just directed the department to bring it right back to us in a, in a different forum. But um, the protection of our fisheries is urgent and it does require urgent attention. And so um, we want to make sure that this work proceeds and we'll do our best to make sure that it proceeds uh, in, in an urgent fashion. Uh, Director, is there anything else that you would like to share before we conclude today? No, thank you all for um, your participation and your quick study with all the materials. Um, thank you. All right, thank you everybody for your participation today. Thank you, Mr. Kirsch, for joining us. Um, and we will, I will now entertain a motion to conclude our meeting at 1.11 p.m. This is Commissioner Kyle, so moved. We have any objection to ending our meeting? Hearing none, we are concluded. Thank you, everybody. Stay well. Right. And thank you, Chair George. This is Stephanie Caldera, your commission assistant. I will end the recording and close this special meeting of the commission today. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you very much, Stephanie.